Hi everybody, um, uh, good to see you uh, this evening. My name, if you don't already know me, is Justin Searles. Uh, you can find me on Twitter just by my last name, Searles, and uh, if you have any feedback about the screencast, uh, feel free to reach out to us at Test Double, our software agency, uh, at hello at testdouble.com. Uh, so today, why are we here? What am I talking about? Uh, a couple of things uh, that I've been working on lately, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, doing trainings and working on a new talk, uh, have led me to build this wiki uh, that you can get through this short URL uh, that's up on GitHub, and basically I've just been trying to document a whole bunch of nuanced topics in testing that don't get a lot of press, don't get a lot of documentation, um, uh, because either they're out of vogue or they're just uh, 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 you know a little bit more even-handed than some of the dogma and evangelism that we tend to see about testing and TDD specifically. Um, additionally, and kind of piggybacking off of that, uh, to practice isolated TDD the way I like in JavaScript, I wound up writing a, a, a new testable uh, library for JavaScript called testable.js. Uh, the confusion, the brand confusion is not lost on me that I just made a library the same name as the company four years after we started the company, uh, but uh, at least now I have a, a lockdown on the NPM module name. So uh, <laughs> we're going to talk tonight about TDD uh, and some nuanced differentiators uh, uh, that a lot of people, I, I've learned recently, don't have a very firm grasp on. Uh, and uh, I'm going to only share my perspective on it. Uh, if, first of all, if you don't know what TDD is, it stands for Test Driven Development. That is where you write the tests first and they actually drive uh, the design of your code. Um, yeah, test Driven Development does not equal testing, but because all of our modern testing tools, all the libraries that we use and the frameworks have been so heavily influenced uh, by, by TDD culture and, and you know, to, to put it kindly, <laughs> uh, evangelism uh, that, that, that's really been pushed uh, all over the place, uh, there's really no way to, to, to t detangle uh, proper like testing software, making sure software works, and test-driven development, which is a workflow for building new software. Uh, in fact, a lot of people building tools build them with TDD in mind, and then they're consumed for simple like, you know, testing after the fact kind of stuff. Uh, and this conflation of ideas of tools being used for multiple different purposes and contexts has just caused a whole explosion of, of confusion among developers. Uh, so we're just going to talk about some of the foundational ideas between two different uh, schools of TDD. Uh, and even if you don't practice TDD, this might help color some of like the strange words and proper nouns that you run into when you're reading about testing or you're trying to learn about a new tool and understand some of the de maybe design implications uh, that went into it, regardless of whether that, that's how you're going to use a particular tool. Um, so first of all, in one camp, and these are arbitrary names that I've sort of cargo culted that I don't think anyone really likes or agrees to, uh, is uh, called Detroit School TDD, named after the um, fact that the extreme programming movement kind of started in the late 90s on what was called the Three C's Project. At, uh, it was a contract project at Chrysler, which happens to be in Detroit. Uh, so this is also, uh, Martin Fowler refers to this in his uh, a very popular wiki article, Mox Aren't Stubs, as classic TDD, and it's called classic because it came first, but you know, if you follow folks like Kent Beck or Uncle Bob and have read what they have to write about TDD, uh, uh, this is the kind of TDD uh, that, Det that I'm referring to when I call Detroit or classic. The other half, the other school that we're going to talk about is London School TDD, and it's named as such because the extreme programming community in London really did some very interesting iterations on the concepts of TDD, uh, and I've continued to improvise on them in my own practice, but I uh, have done a really, really poor job of giving back and understanding, you know, uh, uh, where, where we've taken it and other things that I've observed in the community. Uh, and Martin Fowler refers to this as mockist uh, TDD, which sounds like a pretty pejorative negative term, so I don't tend to use it very much. Um, but if you've ever heard of the book Goose, that stands for Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests, and that was written by Matt Price and Steve Freeman. Uh, there, it's a really excellent book. Um, uh, I think it, it, it expresses a lot of very interesting concepts and it really opened my mind to a whole new way of looking at tests driving the design of my code um, by actually coupling them to the implementation, which is considered a no-no uh, on, the, on the other side of the aisle, uh, but has some interesting design implications that I think are very healthy for how I work as a developer. So first, a little bit about Detroit School. Some of the facets are, you know, when you hear Detroit School, uh, you know, consider it's like, you know, just the very classical, I'm sure most of you run into this, you know, the loop of red, uh, failing, write a failing test, make that test go green, uh, change the message, change the message, make it pass, make it get to a green test. And then the next step is refactor the code, clean it up, get it ready for whatever the next feature is so that 
when you write the failing test for the next feature, it's easy to go green again, and so on and so forth. Um, so Detroit School is typified by a few different aspects. For example, it allows you, uh, and it emphasizes working in tiny little steps. So until you can articulate a, um, a test that is both useful and achievable right out of the gate, uh, uh, you, you need to break the problem down further, which is, um, you know, breaking big problems down is a big part of our job, so that's healthy. Uh, every test needs to ensure that the code is working is a big part of it, because after the, after the tests come back, uh, we should have like a regression suite left behind. Um, and, and the design of our code, as opposed to architecting everything up front, sort of emerges naturally because we're frequently in, um, iterating in this tight little feedback loop, building little piece after little piece, and then refactoring. And when people say refactoring, they often just mean change shit, um, but, but the, the term refactoring in this sense means change the implementation of the code without changing the behavior. So we have all these green tests, that means that we can rigorously redesign, apply design patterns, uh, pull stuff out, extract it, re-architect re everything until it's really, really nice and clean, all the while knowing that as long as our tests are still passing, everything is still working. And that's a, a luxury that most software systems without such rigorous testing don't have. Uh, so, so the relationship between being really well tested and being very safe to refactor uh, is, I think, tantamount to just how people who practice Detroit School TDD uh, view and approach testing, which is part of why they don't like London School, but we'll get to that in the future. Also, uh, in, in reality, what I found is everybody forgets to refactor. Uh, so we go red, green, refactor, red, green, refactor, and then we get a little bit lazy, and then we just go red, green, red, green, red, green, and then people have these gigantic messes. Uh, and so one of the problems I run into with Detroit School over and over again is that folks will uh, wind up with, um, you know, test driving through a single entry point and then having a 400 line long class before they've realized like, huh, maybe I should have been pulling this out and, and, and kind of gardening this a little bit more aggressively. And uh, the only kind of counterpoint that I've heard to this is like exhortations that people be more professional and just try harder, um, which which might be true, uh, it, you know, if you're following this workflow really um, carefully. Uh, but but I'd much rather the workflow bake that into the process, and that's one of the reasons why um, I've been so attracted to sort of the London School way of doing things. So given that, Detroit School is uh, really good at developing small working things because you have to break the problem down first to the point where you can start to write some tests against it. Um, uh, but, but when we talk about TDD, people often talk about like wanting to test drive everything, test drive their whole project. If they want to write, like, you know, for example, a new HTTP controller that responds to a particular action, takes some inputs and returns some outputs, um, you know, that's very, very high level and it might result in like, you know, tons of objects and functions and different behaviors. Uh, and you want to TDD the whole thing, how do you actually compose all these little things into one big thing using TDD is like a very common stumbling block that people run into. They can do the fun little code katas and the bowling game and tennis and whatnot, uh, but then when they try to apply this to like their real projects, they kind of only are, are successful in small little pockets. Um, so the, the, the kind of fundamental question that people who practice Detroit School TDD uh, have to ask themselves are like, what are my small things? I have to figure that out up front. Uh, uh, you know, what are my domain objects? Uh, before you ask the question of how do those domain objects actually get plugged into, um, you know, whatever my higher order thing, maybe it's a, the, the HTTP controller um, I referenced earlier, or maybe it's some batch process or some, something that like, you know, gets plugged into a queuing system. Regardless, you got to start small. So asking yourself, what are the small things is kind of like the key design point uh, that a lot of, that, that this process requires you to undergo before you even get to the point where you're like writing code. Um, so as a result, this is often referred to as bottom-up TDD, um, because imagine that you like are handed a story card, and the story card says, all right, I need you to accept some invoices, um, and then uh, they go through some kind of approval workflow, maybe some validation, and then a human has to sign off them, and then uh, they initiate bank transfers, uh, like modeled as payments in our system. Uh, now, now, uh, if you hear this and you, you're you're practicing a Detroit School TDD, the first thing you want to do is like, all right, let's find something we can start writing tests around. And usually that means carving up the problem until you get to a small enough thing that you can start to iterate on um, uh, the logic that you know is 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 critical to getting the feature written. So you might start with like, for example, like an invoice domain object and it has all the behavior that invoices need to have on them. Uh, kind of traditional OOP kind of stuff here where you've got data, uh, you got state in that object as well as, as behavior because uh, uh, that's how a lot of folks roll. Maybe you come up with a user object, uh, approval objects to, to, to um, you know, hold on to the state that who approved it and when and so forth. 
uh, maybe a payment object that you're going to go and ship off to the bank. And then the harder question is, okay, so now I need things that can take advantage of these already probably, like, you know, invoice might have 20 tests against it. So it's a pretty, you know, um, there's a lot of reuse, even though that re that even though it might be used in production zero times. So the API is actually pretty stable. And we can probably be pretty sure the API is clean, easy to use, but we don't necessarily have any feedback yet that it's what the system, the broader system really needs. And so, um, at this point, we have to figure out what the higher order thing is that's going to, for example, use invoices or users. Um, maybe the first thing we have to do is that approve invoice step. Uh, so, so maybe that takes uh, you know some kind of input, passes to invoice, creates our domain object based on that input. Uh, maybe we have to go and fetch a user as a result. And however that approve invoice unit has to interact with invoices and users, it's kind of stuck with whatever our decisions were at that bottom layer. And so if it was awkward, if those interactions were, were unusual, uh, then we're going to end up with an awkward middle layer in our system. Uh, uh, maybe the next step is uh, cutting payments out, you know, uh, uh, making payment objects out of these invoices based on the criteria of those invoices. And then maybe a third step is, uh, you know, something that talks to the periphery of our system, some third party integration like sending off to a bank. Um, and now when we talk about this highest order thing, it's like now we get to write our little like, you know, HTTP controller at the top because we built all those other kind of building blocks is how I kind of envisioned them. Uh, so, so now this accepts invoices controller at the top, we'll go and wire this in. Now, obviously this is a very, very broad generalization. Uh, in reality, if you're practicing any kind of testing development, you can start wherever you like uh, and carve it up however you like. But this is just a pattern that I see emerge a lot among people who I, who I, who I view as more ardent uh, in, in this camp and in this mode of thinking about test-driven development. So yeah, each one of these little things has their own little red-green refactor cycle. And now I'm kind of curious of why I, why I copied that there, but let's move on. So I say that to, to mention that like up to this point, you're probably tracking pretty well uh, because this is the only TDD that most people know. It was the, you know, extreme programming was incredibly successful. A lot of the, the original proponents of like the Agile manifesto, this is like, this is the TDD that they knew and loved and what they, you know, what came first and really what dominated uh, uh, the airwaves and a lot of the tooling around things like, for example, testable libraries are mostly just thinking about how to help people write uh, uh, TDD or write testing kind of underneath this worldview and culture. So some of the pros of Detroit School are, uh, first of all, all those left behind tests, they serve as like a robust regression suite, right? You have that high coverage, which means that you can refactor a lot. This is kind of baked into the workflow. Um, it's also very easy to conceptualize and get started. Like you are now a certified Detroit School TDD or because I basically just said everything that you need to know to go and take a stab at this. Um, uh, the downside or, you know, a contrasting point to this though, is that uh, it doesn't necessarily say very much about how your system should be designed. You'll probably arrive at designs um, like, you know, maybe solid principles or something that will be more usable uh, because as you write a lot of tests against code, instead of only being used in one place, it's going to be used by 20 tests as well. So that'll, that'll help out the design of your public APIs, but it doesn't offer a lot of design influence about your private APIs. And so however you organize your code internally is probably going to be roughly similar to how you do it now until you find places that are just hard to test. Uh, some downsides of Detroit School TDD. First of all, um, there's a huge risk of waste. I like alluded to that earlier. So if we mispredict whatever some particular unit's colors are going to need, whether that's the method signature of how we want to call them, the data inputs that we have available, the return type that we want back, uh, that might create waste. We might have to dive down into that layer again and then change stuff. Um, I say change, not refactor, because we're going to have to change tests, change the behavior, uh, and, and that I consider wasteful. It's not refactoring per se. Also, you know, like I mentioned, the design influence is limited. So people tend to um, still kind of get stuck at this wall of trying to apply heavyweight design patterns to their code because if you defer the refactoring step long enough, you're going to end up with such a mess that you're going to have to just noodle for a long time about how to possibly clean it up. Um, obviously, uh, uh, Detroit School TDD does not prescribe going a long time without refactoring, but because uh, it's so addictive, the, the, the red-green cycle, it, it takes a lot of discipline to refactor aggressively, and I've seen very few teams succeed at it. <laughs> 
Um, also, I felt that personally, uh, I get a very poor sense of, of progress. Like my, my ability to estimate like how long things are going to take me, or even the sense that like I'm making progress over the course of a day, is limited because I'm built maybe all these building blocks, but I, until I see it come together, it's not really real to me. Uh, so, so for just the endorphins of a happy workday, uh, I'm, I'm sometimes just feeling like I'm squirreled away in really deep rabbit holes when I practice Detroit School TDD. Also. Um, uh, all of that redundant code coverage, that might be robust and that might provide us a lot of refactoring safety because all the layers at the top, like that test of that controller at the top, is going to call through to all those units and layers beneath it. So yeah, we have everything covered eight ways to Tuesday, but if anything has to change at all in one of those lower layers, each layer above it, uh, those tests might be impacted in incidental and unimportant ways. So if I change one of the lower layers, like for example, like just some sort of you know rounding calculation in, in the payment, uh, I can expect that every unit that's a higher order unit than that one calling anything that depends on payment, uh, that those tests might break in, in, and be test, uh, false negatives. So I just have to go clean up a bunch of tests and that's never any fun. Uh, redundant code coverage can have a lot of costs down the road. Also keep in mind, um, you know, I've mentioned test doubles. Uh, test double is a catch-all term for, for things like mocks and stubs. Um, the Detroit School, because it values that refactor safety and the, the, the stay-behind regression value of the overall test suite, um, test doubles are injecting fantasy into what should be a highly realistic thing. And so, you know, the way I view it is that in this school of thought, there, there are these affordances that should really be minimized, if not avoided. You know, we should use test doubles only to the extent that like, man, this is really hard to test and we can't think of a way to improve our design. Or maybe we should use them only to um, uh, cordon off the periphery of our application. So like, let's have our tests only cover the stuff that's in our repository, or let's have our tests avoid, um, you know, re-verifying stuff that a third party API is doing, you know, don't test the framework. Um, and so, so the the perspective on test doubles is really pretty negative. You know, they're there as a convenience, uh, but but a lot of people who are ardent Detroit School fans will suggest you you roll your own so that it be kind of like a syntactic vinegar to to discourage you from overusing test doubles. People often use the phrase like over mocking in this sense, uh, which is which is problematic when you talk about London School because there's almost no such thing as over mocking. In fact, mocks are integral to the process of of of, of design. So that said, I referred to London School a bunch without explaining it. Sorry about that. Uh, so let's dive into it now. Um, so when I say London School TDD, I'm really talking about how I was inspired by, by the book Goose, Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests by Steve Freeman, Nat Price. Um, you know, I thought it was a really, really thoughtful book. Uh, I feel like I read it in 2009. I'm not sure if it was published at all earlier than that, but it's been around for at least five or six years. And so, uh, especially since I've moved on from Java to, to Ruby and a lot more JavaScript, uh, I've uh, uh, improvised a bunch and, and, and iterated a bunch, trying to just get at the perfectly minimal workflow uh, that, that consistently results in small and focused units. And that's what I'm going to share with you. Um, so several years have passed and I, I feel like when I call this stuff London School anymore, I'm actually like artificially attributing a bunch of stuff that's circling around my head, but that the London XP community never actually talked about or did. Uh, and I don't want to be putting words in Steve or Nat's mouths. Uh, uh, so this is not Goose per se, it's not London School TDD per se. Everything from this point forward is something that I've just dubbed discovery testing, because uh, I simply don't want to misrepresent somebody else's work. Uh, this is, uh, like it or like it or hate it, uh, something that is mostly my fault, but heavily influenced by all the fantastic developers that I've gotten to pair with uh, over the years. So instead of bottom-up bottom, uh, bottom up TDD, this is often referred to as top-down TDD. So let's take the same story. Um, we're to accept invoices, approve them, and then initiate bank transfers. Now in top-down TDD, uh, uh, and part of why I like London School is whenever I get a story like that that's really broad, that covers a lot of responsibilities, obviously one thing that I could do is break it down further with the product owner or with the team. Uh, but even once I do that, it's very common for me because I'm a high anxiety individual to get a story like that and then panic and be like, how am I ever going to do this? Um, you know, I can articulate really well what the high order concerns are, but like I'll get, I'll get so stuck um, uh, squirreling away and like getting lost in, in detailed worries of 
how some very, very detail-oriented thing is going to work uh, that that'll distract me from being productive at all. And I found that this is a workflow that helps me focus on how to take a big problem and break it down. Whereas breaking down the problem is kind of a, um, you know, a take home assignment with Detroit School TDD that you just have to be rigorous about on your own. So it all starts with articulating what you have to do at the top really well. So in this case, um, working top down, I know that the first thing I have to do is accept some invoices. And that's going to force me to think about two things, really. Um, I, I, it's going to force me to think about, you know, like, what are my data types? So, like, what are my inputs? What are my outputs? It's also going to force me to think about um, uh, what SICP, I think, called uh, uh, writing the code you wished you had. Um, uh, I think that was it. In any case, <laughs> you, 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 you try to ask yourself at every single step whenever you're writing a test of a new unit is, uh, could something else do this job for me? And if something else could do part of this job for me, what would that be? And, and if there was a second part of this um, uh, job to do, what would that second thing be? And then how would those two things talk to each other? You know, what data input would flow to the first one? And then what result from the first one would pass on to the second one? Maybe the third one? Normally, I, f I fall into trying to land between two to four things. And a surprising amount of the time, a worrisome amount of the time, I landed exactly three things. Um, and uh, even if, that's a, if three is an arbitrary uh, number, what it means is that I've now broken the problem down into three little sub-triangles, uh, each of their own trees of, 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 of work to do. So I might start by thinking, okay, well, if I'm uh, accepting invoices, then I need to think about invoices, obviously, as, as one of my value objects. Um, I'll probably think of like, you know, the responsibility of proving those invoices. Uh, so I've got to think about like an approval value, maybe. Also, the, the user who's going to do that approval. And then I think about, you know, somebody needs to cut a payment, create a payment object, do any sort of translation there. And uh, that means I need a payment value. And then obviously I need something that's going to send a signal to a bank. Um, uh, the structure that you see where you have, you know, some kind of input at the top, uh, and then you know that this whole um, uh, gigantic tree of, of behavior is like a void method. It's, it's there for the side effect. We're going to send something to the banks and we might not get any sort of meaningful data back. Uh, so when what I found when I break problems down this way is that the stuff to the left of these trees tends to be about getting all the information I need. Maybe that's the part where I access a database or I, or I use an API to get some data, aggregate it. The part in the middle is where I transform that data and munge it so that I can do whatever calculations I need or whatever sort of collection sorting and preparation for maybe in, in cases like this where I got a side effect where I'm talking to another system, be ready to send it off. And the third step is mostly wrapping third-party APIs so that I can cleanly send it off. Um, maybe if we were to break it down further, like so, so just stopping at like this, this top layer of these four things, I'd write a test there and get, get that test passing. And then I would just focus on just one of these subtrees. And so if I was focusing on just the approved invoice subtree, I might think, well, maybe there's some component of this where I can do some pre-validation logic using one or two pure functions that just do smell tests against the invoice, make sure that it's okay. And then um, you know something else that uh, uh, sends off that, that invoice to some user-facing system uh, that, that'll request the approval of a real human being. And maybe that's something that this application doesn't own, uh, so it's simply a wrapper that goes and calls through to some third-party system. So if you break down the different types of units that usually shake down when you practice top-down TDD like this in discovery testing, uh, these things at the top are probably all going to be what I call collaborator objects. And collaborator objects are objects that tend not to have any logic really at all, or very minimal logic. But the goal of those collaborator objects is help you as a designer discover all of their dependencies, first by using test doubles, using fake things that don't exist yet, but to use that first test. Right now, at this point, we've written one test, maybe this accept invoices test, and we'll have those four units at the top. Uh, as well as the four value objects at the side. So it's shaking out a lot of different, um, usually types and uh, different units of, uh, of, of behavior. Um, we're using that as a sounding board really early. Like we'll figure out like, oh, well, um, this data type doesn't make sense as it flows from this dependency to this dependency. And it's because the code doesn't exist yet, it's literally the cheapest time to ever make that change. Uh, and so I might go through several iterations of, of changing around dependencies as a result.
Um, so the, the next thing to look at over here, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, these are uh, uh, what I call value objects. They kind of live apart from the tree. And what they do is they wrap the data that's important to our applications, and then they provide methods that present information usefully. So if you view the whole thing like a tree, all of that tree is really just stateless behavior. So if you're writing in a functional language, they're just functions. If you're writing in a classical language, they're just, you know, uh, uh, they might be classes or objects, but typically they're only really there for the um, behavior. If they have um, any any state on them, it's probably just to hold references to their collaborator objects, not to hold references to any units of work or state that's in progress. Uh, these value objects off to the side, they're the stuff that flows through the pipes, um, gets passed into functions or get, gets returned from functions. Um, so that's that. As we dig deeper into the system, we get to a couple of interesting other types. That's why I, I um, bothered showing one right now, and that is uh, uh, if you start with like that validate invoice thing. I mentioned that was probably just a pure function. That's probably just checking heuristics. Uh, means it's really easy to test, just just inputs and outputs. That means um, uh, that it's what I call a logical leaf node. I don't have a really great name for this, and that's kind of long to say, but I'll, I'll usually call it like a, a logical unit or, a, or just a leaf node. And those are pure functions, and they contain some kind of useful logic. What's interesting here is that you don't need to use testables for that stuff. Because we can just test the pure inputs and outputs, and we know that these things should not have dependencies, since it shouldn't have dependencies, that means it doesn't need to use testables. And so we can write a traditional Detroit-style TDD test um, of, of that valid invoice unit, and maybe have a whole bunch of tests, and it'll feel just like a normal uh, TDD workflow. And the tests that we have uh, as we walk away from that continue to be useful for regression, uh, and that, that that particular unit might be useful if reused somewhere else. Um, I think the name of the game here is break down the design sufficiently enough so that you can identify really clean, well-named uh, uh, logical leaf nodes that will ultimately be small enough to be maintainable. Um, and the, if you can maximize those logical leaf nodes, then you're going to spend a lot of time writing tests uh, that, are, that are a lot more fun to write, right, of just a pure function of inputs and outputs uh, than necessarily thinking about bigger things. This last thing here um, might be an example, because I mentioned it was calling through to a third-party system or a third-party API, uh, what I usually call wrapper objects. Um, you know, uh, if you've ever heard the phrase, don't mock what you uh, don't own or only mock what you own, uh, the idea of a wrapper object is that you'll start off just delegating to that third-party code. Maybe all it does is mirror the method signature of the third-party code that you're going to call. Um, but then whenever that API is hard to uh, hard to test double, hard to mock in the layer above it, we can respond to that test pane by actually taking some of that mess and pushing it into the wrapper itself. So that just like uh, all of the other units in, that, that we own in our system, uh, they can be heavily influenced by how easy they are to test, and it can kind of quack just like all of our other units and feel like a normal unit. But under the covers, it's, just, it's actually got this big gnarly mess that translates basically our domain language and how we like to write our own code into however that, that the, the person who's providing their third-party code likes to write their code. Um, that means that writing unit tests of this stuff is probably not that useful. It probably means that really, um, unless that translation layer is really complicated, it's probably just testing the third-party stuff. So I usually don't write any unit tests for these, and I, I, I use the safety net of like a full integration test uh, to tell me that I wired everything up correctly. So if you look at this big thing, I said earlier that, that um, discovery testing was all about uh, uh, using a lot of testables to shake out your design, and that means that when we look at this top level thing, these tests will use testables because they're shaking out the design. But in the, in the event of the uh, shaken out design elements they, that, that, that are irreducible, like the value objects and then everything in the leaf nodes like those wrappers and those values, those tests shouldn't have any testables, and as a result, there's still you know valuable regression uh, safety that's provided by those tests. Um, so if you can think of the kind of breakdown tests at the top, a lot of people who practice uh, or talk about at least practicing discovery testing and, and practices like it will say like, well, those tests might not have a lot of value long term, and and I will say at least that it's true that their value is very much front loaded. They were there mostly as a design tool to help us break the problem down well. And uh, I keep them around because there's no harm in keeping them around, and if I just am making minor changes, I can continue to test those out. Um, but if I'm making any big changes, I'll probably end up with so many little things that I, uh, I instead I favor doing rewrites. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I, earlier I said that if you've looked at Detroit School before, you probably are familiar with it. Odds are you've never really seen this kind of TDD practiced carefully. Um, 
you know, it just so as a result, sharing my own experience, some of the pros that I've seen with this is it puts an intense design pressure that will consistently yield um, not just small and focused units, but units that look a lot alike. You end up with a lot of consistency when you follow this rigorously. It doesn't mean consistent um, in the sense that everything has to behave the same way, but you'll find ways that, that make it easy to test that will just slot into uh, you know, a, a consistent template. And that way when you're reading a test, for example, the, the uh, parts that, are, that are, are the same between units kind of disappears and what's special about each unit is what pops off the screen. Uh, makes it really easy to read both tests and code when stuff is small and consistent. Also, there's, because we're working top down, there's very little room for waste. Every method signature and type is validated in a higher order test before we ever have to worry about making it exist. And we only ever um, go and write code that's been mandated into existence by some higher order test. We're never off to the side just building other objects for fun. And not to say that anyone ever uh, sets out to do that, but there's never any risk that we're gonna write code that doesn't get plugged in well later. Um, also, uh, interesting thing is like, there's refactoring is not built into this. There's no part of uh, this process that says, okay, now we all have to be professionals and clean up after ourselves. Uh, because I know in reality that once you get to working code, 5 p.m. might happen, and then you push your code. Um, and uh, if you're under any kind of pressure at all, any de delivery pressure can be really difficult to justify to yourself and to your team and to your bosses uh, that, hey, we have to go and take time to clean stuff up. And that's how teams get racked with tons of technical debt. So I kind of like the fact that refactoring is not part of this workflow. If you find yourself doing a lot of refactoring, it probably means you're still learning how to, how to uh, make effective use of the, of, of the process to break stuff down well in the first place. Uh, uh, there are a few downsides. Um, uh, for example, that explanation took me a lot longer and I didn't do even that great of a job. Uh, uh, so it's much more complex to learn than simply like the red green refactor flow that you see in traditional TDD. Um, also, if you have any like radical impl implementation changes or frequent churn uh, in, in, in requirements, Unless you've organized everything really, really well, uh, it can be it can be difficult to change the implementation because you don't get the same re uh, regression safety at those higher order objects. Um, you know, there the 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 test in uh, in this parlance would be very tightly coupled to the implementation because it knows about not only what your dependencies are but how those things are called because it's literally specifying those interactions. Uh, so as a result, refactoring inside any unit is still relatively easy, but making broad sweeping changes is very difficult. And so what I try to do whenever I have a big change is identify like the most narrow subtree I can that is affected by that change, and then actually bake into my process, deleting it and driving it out fresh. Uh, this is one way to stave off against very old code bases kind of getting crusty and technical debt mounting up because if, if uh, uh, there's the renewal action of when things change, let's drive it out again because future us is going to understand the domain better than current us does or than past us did. Um, uh, uh, we'll end up in a better place because we're kind of building systems that, 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 that in very small iterative bits gets rewritten more naturally. Because usually whenever I say the word rewrite, people freak out, but it's actually fun to rewrite small bits of code in a controlled fashion. Uh, uh, the problem is most people don't undergo any rewrites at all until things pile up and then it becomes a multi-year crazy quagmire of a process. Um, uh, another con here is that these, these, like I mentioned earlier, because that value of those collaborator tests is so front-loaded and so design-heavy, um, they're often misunderstood as being worthless uh, after the fact. Uh, it's, it's true that they don't provide a lot of regression safety in the sense that uh, um, uh, if things aren't working, those are probably not the tests that are going to go red because they don't verify that everything was glued together correctly. And so they tend not to be valued very much by, by people who don't practice this workflow themselves. Um, uh, I think that it's... It's just a little bit of a mindset shift. Um, really, all of these practices, TDD of either stripe, is mostly about thoughtfulness. It's about it's about being more careful and moving a little bit more deliberately when we design code. And the long-term benefit of those tests might not be they're running in CI all the time. The long-term benefit might be that we arrived at a design of a bunch of small things in the first place. Uh, so I don't have the same sort of negative uh, uh, bias against it, but I can understand why some people do. All right, so, so now that you've gotten this kind of description of these two different camps, please keep this in mind next time you hear something about overmocking or you talk to somebody about, you know, uh, uh, one of the discussions that led to this me doing the screencast tonight was talking about partial mocking. Um, 
some people use test doubles as a convenience or as an affordance when they're practicing, you know, kind of like uh, what I call Detroit school TDD. But, but uh, the, the latter, discovery testing, actually makes very, very heavy use of test doubles, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, it's kind of baked into the process to help us break stuff down. So, um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, most test double libraries are either designed you know, for either context or for both contexts or for one context or the other. And because people tend not to carry a really rich understanding of this topic, uh, it's, it's the older or especially bigger test double libraries tend to become rather relatively unopinionated. And because novices, especially uh, uh, on these topics, uh, uh, become confused by that unopinionatedness, like how to use the testable library well, people can really tie themselves into nut knots with different testable libraries out there. So I prefer them to be very highly focused and really laser lasered in on just how I practice discovery testing. Um, and that's probably why I've had to write a few of my own. Um, so, so without further ado, that was all background uh, for us to actually go and get to do a thing together. We're gonna, we're gonna actually practice uh, London School TDD, or discovery testing as I call it, um, on uh, a problem that you might have heard of called Conway's Game of Life. Uh, Conway's Game of Life is famous in our community, in the Agile community, because of Code Retreat, uh, which uh, uh, several folks in, in the Midwest started. I think uh, uh, Nayan and Patrick Welsh and Gary Bernhardt and Corey Haynes uh, 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 put together, and, and Corey kind of just kept running with it until it became a big global thing. But at Code Retreat, what you do is you practice TDD on the Game of Life problem uh, several times in a day with different pair partners to, to, to tackle the problem differently. The reason that they picked that game is because it's pretty big. You're simulating an infinite petri dish of cells over time. And uh, because it's an infinite petri dish of cells uh, uh, and because it, f you know, it lends itself well to kind of, you know, creative domain modeling, y y there's no way that you're going to really get done in 45 minutes. Um, the basic rules of the game are each cell in this petri dish has eight neighbors. You know, it's like a grid system. Um, uh, as, as and all the rules here are about like as trans uh, as generations transition. So if you have like a state of the board, you, the question that the program needs to answer is what's the next state of the board look like. So you might call that a generation. So if you're looking at a cell and it has eight neighbors and fewer than two of them are live, then it will die as if by starvation. Uh, if, if it has two or three live neighbors, then it survives. If it has four or more live neighbors, then it dies, as if by overcrowding. Also, dead cells with exactly three live neighbors will come back to life, and this is, this is what keeps the game from just being a simple attrition where everything dies out eventually. Um, this can result in some pretty cool little patterns. There's a whole bunch of, like, you know, pulsars and oscillators, just things that emerge naturally through the random seeding of the board game. Uh, and it's part of why I think the, the, the game culturally has uh, lived on for so long. Uh, a bigger board game, uh, you know, might look something like this. Normally, uh, you'll see certain different kind of uh, uh, elements ossify, but you typically won't see everything get taken over or anything like that. It has this real... Kind of, and maybe this is why it's called Game of Life, like Life Like Cadence Stewart. It's kind of fun. So Game of Life and TDD is an interesting topic because every code retreat that I've ever been to, and I've been to five or six uh, at least, uh, and facilitated a few of them, 45 minutes is not enough time to really do the problem well. Uh, it's enough time to tackle a small part of the problem, like maybe to model the rules or maybe to model um, the grid. You know, people usually pick one or the other. Um, but practicing TDD how I like to top down and really like considering the entire simulation and breaking it down like that uh, just takes me a little bit more time because I'm tackling more work. Uh, and so I tend to get frustrated because it favors bottom up TDD. Um, you know, like let's let's do interesting stuff with the game rules here and then build on top of it and build some pure functions. Uh, but then the timer goes and we never really plug it into anything. Uh, what I'd much rather do is get the get the top couple layers down pat and then know that I can go and fill in those bottom details later. And so that's what I set out to do in this example that we're going to redrive through today. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and, uh, and do it. Uh, we're going to use everybody's uh, favorite programming language. It's a really popular new hip programming language that's just trending on Hacker News every day. It's called the Java programming language. Uh, I know that uh, uh, you're probably really excited to dive into the Eclipse IDE, which is just this massive tool with thousands of little widgets. 
um, because because it's just the coolest thing ever. Um, the the reason that we're using Java is because the static typing system and the built-in tooling uh, can can actually help us uh, understand some of the value inherent here. Uh, it gives us it's kind of like learning how to bowl with bumper lanes before we um, you know go out for real. Uh, because trying to dive into this in, in strictly just a dynamic language, a little bit can be lost in translation. And so having a real type system uh, that forces us to define the types of values, uh, I think is probably a better learning instrument. So we're going to use Java today to drive this out. So let's hop over. Uh, I'm going to go and get my system all set up. Uh, knowing Eclipse and Java, that's probably going to take me several hours, so it might be daytime by the time you see me. But hopefully uh, uh, the discussion up to this point has been valuable. Uh, if not a little long-winded, sorry about that. That's how I roll when I don't have a lot of preparation time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to getting started with you. Thanks.